Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mehdi Ross. I'm one of the attorneys here at Ross and Law Firm. And we're going to be discussing today a uh, pretty dry but very, very important uh, how to try a case uh, for a DUI pretrial as well as DUI motions. So for DUIs, uh, the first thing you want to look at is the discovery and you want to this is a checklist now by no means is this an exhaustive checklist uh, but I'm going to go through some of the things that you want to make sure you have in every DUI before you start so first is the probable cause affidavits and the narratives uh, read them carefully keep an eye out for any officers in the narratives that are not listed in the witness list. This happens all the time. The state being the state, uh, they miss things and it's gonna be up to you whether you wanna point it out, but you will see this often where there will be other officers. Sometimes they list one officer in the witness list and there's actually five officers who were involved. Now, sometimes that works to your benefit, sometimes it doesn't, uh, but understand that when the officers are included in the discovery packet, you are technically on notice. So even if let's say they add a last minute witness, if that witness was mentioned in the discovery packet, then you are deemed on notice, which means it will not be a discovery violation. So you won't be able to get a Richardson hearing for that. Um, so that's a probable cause in the narratives. Additionally, you want to look at the tickets. Okay. And this is very important, especially for the DUI motions, because uh, the tickets will say there will always be a ticket for a DUI and you need to see who the officer is who wrote that. But additionally, you want to see what ticket was written for the stop because we're gonna be getting into some stop motions in a minute. And so for example, if let's say the officer says that they stopped your client for tints that were too dark, then you want to make sure that the ticket is for tints too dark. If they say that your client was weaving, then you want to make sure there's a ticket here for failure to maintain a single lane. Again, if they get for that and the officer alleges that's the reason for the stop, then certainly you can argue that it was a pretextual stop. So you want to make sure you have the tickets in there. Additionally, you want to have the DMV driving record. This is especially important if it's not their first DUI arrest. Manny went into some of that as well. This is very as uh, for several reasons. One, if it's not their first DUI, like if it's a second DUI, you want to see when the first DUI happened because a second DUI within five years has a mandatory 10 day jail requirement. But if it's outside of five years, then there is no mandatory jail. Uh, additionally, for example, if it's a third DUI, a third DUI within 10 years, that is a felony. Their DUI outside of 10 years is a misdemeanor. So you want to look at that DMV driving record carefully. The state should provide it, but if not, you should get it yourself. Um, additionally, you also want to check if they've had a prior refusal, because if they've previously refused breath and they refuse breath on your case, then that now becomes a first degree misdemeanor offense, the refusal. If they've never refused before, then it's not a crime, the refusal. You also want to look if there are any medical reports. That's not always going to be the case. However, in cases where there is a crash, there usually will be medical reports. I've seen this a lot lately, especially where officers are taking people involved in accidents to the hospital for medical clearance before they take them to the jail. Now, what that means is at the hospital, they're going to usually take blood because they're at the hospital and they're getting checked out. And so this is sort of a way for cops to get around any probable cause requirements for blood draws, and they can then go through the hospital and request the medical blood that was taken there. And that's actually done as a subpoena, an intent to issue a subpoena for that. You then ask for a hunter hearing, and I think someone else, one of my partners is going to be discussing hunter hearings later on, but you definitely want to get any medical reports. This will have the conversations that they had with the doctors, as well as the doctor's observations. Sometimes these can come in the form of uh, the EMTs. They don't actually take them to the hospital and just look at them on scene. Uh, also, you want to get make sure you have the breath results if there are any. Now, 
the way the breath result discovery will work is you'll just get a paper that shows, okay, they blew uh, that they blew a point one, two at this time, there will be two samples for this. There have to be two valid breath samples and you will also see the testing first because they have the machine has to be calibrated. So it has to be within, I believe, a 0 0.02 um, differential, but you do definitely want to depose the breath tech if your client gave breath, as well as you want to get the agency inspection form. This is not something that's normally disclosed in discovery. This is the form that shows you when that machine was last tested. It's supposed to be tested every month and they're supposed to go through all these different runs of samples, okay? Um, now you can get that very easily from the agency inspector. The agency inspector will be listed as a witness. However, again, the agency inspection report is usually not included, but the agency inspector will usually email it to you. It's not a problem. Uh, additionally, you want to see if, uh, oh, and for breath results, one of the reasons that the agency inspection form is also very important is because there's two types of intoxilizers that are used. One is portable and one is at a breath alcohol testing center. And recently I had a deposition with an officer who says that he doesn't use the portable intoxilizers because he's had interference with the police radio on them before. So certainly you can use something like that to attack the machine and that there may have been interference and that's why your client may be blue too high. Um, you also want to check if there's any urine or blood and make sure that the person who is going to testify to the urine or blood is listed specifically as an expert. Now, this is something that the state learns the hard way. If they list the person who is going to testify to the urine or blood, if they list them as a regular witness, then technically that is a discovery violation and you should ask for a Richardson hearing because they have to specifically be listed as an expert. This is not just for DUIs, this is for all criminal cases, but for DUIs, if there's urine or blood, someone has to be listed as an expert in order to testify about it. Um, like I said, this is not an exhaustive list because even looking at this, I. Uh, I missed the videos. You definitely want to make sure that you have your videos. In this day and age, as Manny mentioned, videos are very important. Um, there's all sorts of different videos you can have in DUIs. If it's Florida Highway Patrol, they don't wear body cams, but they do have dash cams on all four sides of their vehicle. So you can get sound and video from the dash cams. You also want to check if there are any body cams. They will be listed. The officer will write BWC warn. That means that they had a body cam. Also, you want to see if there are any videos from a breath alcohol treatment facility. Generally, this is more with Broward Sheriff's Office. However, I know some of the other agencies have their own uh, breath testing centers. There is usually a separate video there. It is not going to capture the actual breath I don't know why they don't have a, a camera in that room, but when they go through implied consent, when they ask them if they want to give breath, they will do it on video at the breath alcohol testing center. Again, not every agency has that. Some have the portable intoxilizers, but you will know if they have that because it'll tell you and you will have a uh, paper from the discovery that's going to be from the breath tech and they're going to list their observations uh, they're going to talk about the 20 minute observation that they had as well as any statements that your clients made and then they will also include the breath test results so make sure you have that also if your client was in an accident there should be a crash report and the crash report is going to become very important for a motion to suppress that we're going to be list that we're going to be discussing later on um, and as Manny mentioned before, if you're in Broward, there is no diversion program. So you really have to attack a DUI. You know, you're in Palm Beach or Dade County. Yeah, your first DUI, your client can get into the diversion program and then get the charge changed to a reckless. However, in Broward, if you want a reckless driving charge, which is a win, 
you have to work for it. They are not just going to give it to you. And one of the ways we do that is by filing DUI motions. They work. They, that is the way to get what you want in Broward County. And I have never seen a DUI that did not have a possible motion to argue. So I don't ever want to hear, oh, it's a, yeah, this is a pretty simple DUI. There's not really any motions. There's always some motion you can argue. So we're going to go through some of them. Again, I could do an entire day's presentation on DUI motions. So this is not going to cover everything, but this is going to provide a roadmap of how you can attack a DUI, uh, the steps to do that, and the big red flags that you want to look for in filing a DUI motion. And to quote Jedi Master Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. File those motions. Oh, I had my little picture here. There we go. Traffic stops. Okay. One of the first times that, one of the first things you want to look for is the traffic stop. Okay. So this means your client was stopped for speeding or any kind of traffic infraction, right? Now, a police officer must have probable cause to believe a traffic violation has occurred. And I have several cases that I'm going to cite because, again, DUI motions, obviously, that's a very case heavy portion. Don't worry about writing these down. You'll have access to this presentation after it's done. OK, so the main thing to remember with a traffic stop is it's probable cause. It's probable cause and it is an objective standard. OK, so there is no, oh, I thought he was speeding. If you're saying he was speeding, then did you use a radar and was that machine calibrated? This is not simply a, oh, and I, I eyeballed him and I believe he was speeding. No, traffic infraction has to have probable cause. And as this case cites, the subjective knowledge, motivation or intention of the individual officer involved is wholly irrelevant. So if the officer thought I can pull him over because he has a tail light out, right? So I'm going to pull him over wrong. If he has two working tail lights per case law, per the Hilton one and Hilton two cases, then that's not a valid stop. It doesn't matter if the officer thought he could, he was wrong and it is an objective basis. So, um, just some typical traffic stops that you're going to see. I, I cite to Herd here. There we go. So this is a, so you can see this a little better. Now in Herd versus Data, and this is a fourth DCA case, so we use that a lot. Um, that is a failure to use a turn signal. And what that case basically said is, although that can be a traffic infraction, if no other traffic was affected by the failure to signal, then it is not a valid stop. So that becomes very important because you are going to see that affecting other traffic is a requirement for some other stops. Uh, so here I cite, I have the failure to maintain a single lane, which is weaving. So that is a classic reason for a stop on a DUI. Also because weaving, unlike speeding or having a bad taillight or having your vehicle not registered, Weaving is sort of a red flag to a, an officer and a jury that your client might have been um, impaired. So you want to attack that weaving stop and the actual it's not called weaving. It's called failure to maintain a single lane. So I have some cases here that I cited. And again, you'll have copies. You are going to see a lot of Florida Law Weekly cases cited. That is because whatever circuit you are practicing in, you want to cite from that circuit. It's where your the meat of your case law is going to come in because again, since most DUIs are misdemeanors, when they get appealed, they get appealed to the circuit court. So that's generally where you're going to have all of your legal cases. Um, now you're still going to cite to some other like Herb v. State, which is a fourth DCA case, but generally you want to cite to the Florida Law Weekly cases because the judge that you're arguing this in front of. Some of them are their cases. So it's great to be able to say, as this court previously ruled, 
et cetera, et cetera. So make sure you do that. So these here are some cases just on failure to maintain a single lane. And again, that other traffic must be affected. Um, again, these are some more cases that, and some of these are things that when you look at this in your discovery, you might think, oh, I don't have a motion to suppress on this. In this case in Alford, the vehicle went in a weaving pattern six to seven times. But again, if there no other traffic was affected, then it's not a valid traffic stop. So you want to look at if there is body cam, you want to look at the driving pattern if it was captured. If there is a dash cam, you want to look at whether that driving pattern was captured. As Manny said earlier, we had a motion to suppress recently where there was no dash cam, but our client had a dash cam. And that's it. That was the motion to suppress and we won it because again, the judge saw that what the officer said happened wasn't correct. And in fact, the, the, it was an improper start was the citation, but in fact, it was a proper start. So boom, that case is gone because if the traffic stop is deemed to be unconstitutional, then the entire case gets thrown out. So that's what's called a dispositive motion. Uh, so again, here are some more cases about uh, driving patterns and about failure to maintain a single lane. Okay, so when talking, oh, and, and just uh, some other tra uh, possible traffic stops that you'll see, you are also going to see, uh, I have a case recently where they were driving too slow. And again, one of the arguments that I'm making that I'm going to be making is that no other traffic was affected because in fact, there were other lanes of travel. She was on the left lane, there were other lanes of travel. So in fact, other vehicles were able to go around her, which means that you are not endangering other vehicles. Now, although an officer needs probable cause in order to effectuate a traffic stop, they can stop a vehicle based on the fellow officer rule. And here I cite to Montez Valaton v. State, if you take nothing out of this presentation, just re read that case. It's an excellent case. It's uh, actually a DUI manslaughter case, but it goes into legal blood draws. It goes into fellow officer rule. It's a Florida Supreme Court case that's pretty recent, and it has an excellent analysis of the fellow officer rule. And what it basically says is, yes, you can have probable cause to ask for a blood draw or to conduct a traffic stop from another officer as long as that was directly communicated to you. It can't be assumed. So in Montez Valaton, the officer was asked to request a legal a blood draw from the person. However, they were not specifically told the things that the other officer observed in order to give probable cause, like beer cans were found in the car. And this officer did not specifically know about that because he was not told. And so Montez Valaton said, nope, there is no fellow officer rule unless there's direct communication. So read that case. Uh, I actually got a DUI manslaughter, no prost, when that case came out because of the legal blood draws. So that is an excellent case uh, for fellow officer rule as well as for blood draws. Also keep in mind, again, not all of this is in slides because there's just so many motions you can do. Uh, if your client is stopped for a traffic stop that turns into a DUI stop, there has to be, there cannot be a, an unreasonable delay. Okay, so keep in mind the time that it takes for the officer to actually start the DUI investigation from the traffic stop because the law says that you can only keep that person there as long as it takes to write the citation. OK, you can't just hold them there and wait for a canine. You can't just hold them there and wait for an officer without more. So unless, if there is just a traffic stop, they can't just keep them there and then turn it into a DUI investigation. And also, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them up. I can, I'll get to them at the end. Uh, they're anonymous, so don't worry about anyone else seeing your questions. All right, so that was traffic stops, traffic stops which require probable cause and they have an objective basis. Then there are investigative stops. Now, investigative stops, unlike traffic stops, do not require probable cause. They only require reasonable suspicion, 
supported by articulable facts that criminal activity may be afoot. Okay, what does that mean? Well, we're gonna get to that because as everything, it's up to interpretation. Now, whenever any law enforcement officer encounters a person under these circumstances that's about to commit a violation of the criminal laws of this state, you can temporarily detain that person for the purpose of ascertaining the identity of the person temporarily detained and the circumstances surrounding his presence, which led the officer to believe that he had committed, was committing, or was about to commit a criminal offense. So what does that mean? that means that it has to be you have to be able to articulate it and it has to be a temporary detention you can't just hold someone indefinitely it is simply to dispel whatever suspicion they had this applies to all cases but for duis specifically dispelling the suspicion can sometimes be for, uh, in the form of field sobriety exercises so that is directly from the florida statutes And like I said before, uh, reasonable suspicion, like probable cause, is dependent upon, upon both the content of information possessed by the police and its degree of reliability. Basically, this is a totality of the circumstances because investigative stops, especially unlike probable cause, uh, unlike uh, traffic stops, investigative stops are based on more than one factor. And you will see that a lot when you get the odor of alcohol because odor of alcohol is almost always one of the factors that's cited in DUI cases for the suspicion of DUI. So again, you want to look at the totality of the circumstances because as Manny was saying before, you know, your client might have a speech impediment or might have an accent or medical conditions that affect their balance. So when you want to look at the totality of the circumstances, because if those are the circumstances that were used for the reasonable suspicion, then you can certainly attack those. All right. Now, when you're looking at the reliability factors, you want to look at whether it's an anonymous tip versus a confidential informant. I threw this in here because recently I, I just had a motion to suppress where the the basis of the stop was from a 911 call stating that this vehicle is driving recklessly so the person gives their name they give their information to the hotline they say that this car is weaving all over the road um and the officer then effectuates a stop based on that call so can that come in Yes, if the officer observes a separate driving pattern as well. And the reason I put this in here is because you'll get anonymous tipsters are people who do not leave their name, citizen informants. Um, and again, I'm sorry, this says confidential informants. They are confidential sometimes, but they're citizen informants in that they will give their name to the officer as well as information. Even if that's not necessarily listed in your discovery, uh, a, C, a citizen informant versus an anonymous tipster is considered more reliable because they are giving their information. Anonymous tipsters are considered inherently unreliable because anybody can call and you know report a crime just because they want to mess with someone. So if you don't, if you're not leaving your information, then that is not deemed to be reliable, and it's as if there was no call, and the officer has to look at everything in a blank slate. Versus a citizen informant does give a degree of reliability. So in the case that I had, the state relied on this case, which is Ellis versus State, uh, and that is that the on-duty officer was making an investigatory stop, but the CI was a, an, an off-duty officer. So again, even if that's what happens, then they have to make their own observations. And so more on investigative stops, uh, you are going to see health stops, okay? So that's this case here, and I don't know why I repeated this. I repeated it because it's very important. So basically, a legitimate concern for the safety of the motoring public can warrant a brief investigatory stop. And again, brief investigatory stop 
to determine whether a driver is ill, tired, or driving under the influence in situations less suspicious than that required for other types of criminal behavior. So when are you going to see this? You're going to see this a lot when someone is sleeping behind the wheel because you know, so they'll, they'll get a call and this is a classic fact pattern of someone is sleeping behind the wheel, either stopped at a red light or sleeping behind the wheel on the side of the road. Okay. Now, again, you want to determine whether or not this stop was brief enough. So in other words, someone sleeping at the side of the wheel and you're making a stop for, to make sure that they're okay. It's a, a, ch a wellness check. So they knock on the window and the person immediately rolls down the window and says oh sorry i fell asleep it's it's been a long day uh, i'm fine well technically that is it and that should be the end because it's just a brief investigatory stop to determine whether everything's okay if then additional factors come out like well when they roll down the window i smelled the strong odor of alcohol and you know they're their eyes were bloodshot and they were slurring their speech. So now this turned from a wellness check into an investigatory stop for a DUI, where at that point, then they're going to say they wanted field sobriety exercises to dispel the suspicion. Um, if your client can't be woken up, which I've seen on a couple of recent cases where there's knocks and knocks and knocks on the window, uh, shaking the car, uh, at opening the car door and actually shaking the person, you know, and then the person wakes up and says, Oh, I'm sorry, officer, here's my library card when you're asking for my driver's license. Well, that's not a good fact pattern for you. And that is definitely going to turn into a valid stop for a DUI. But again, you always want to keep in mind totality of the circumstances. Okay. Don't be discouraged because your client is asleep behind the wheel then rolls down the window and there's an odor of alcohol because we're going to get into it later, but a odor of alcohol is not enough. There have to be other factors and the other factors can be attacked. So again, even if it looks bad, you can always find a motion to suppress. Now, one of the other ways to stop, so there's a traffic stop, there is an investigatory stop, and then there is a car crash, okay? You're going to get a lot of car crashes that turn into DUI investigation, and here the accident report privilege is very important. Okay, so what is the accident report privilege? In Florida, and this is per the statute, in Florida, they want, if you're involved in an accident, the legislature wants you to be open and honest and not be worried about incriminating yourself. So what the legislature says is that we're gonna grant immunity to any statements that you're making in the course of a crash investigation, okay? So that means that when the officers, you know, there is no attacking a stop on a crash investigation because obviously officers are going to come and they're going to investigate what happened, right? It's a crash. Officers are going to be coming. However, when they're speaking to your client and your client starts telling them, you know, the officer says, hey, what happened? Are you OK? And your client starts saying, yeah, you know, I yeah, I, I hit my head on the windshield. Um, I had just come from this bar and had a few drinks. Okay, all of those statements are going to be kept out. Now, you can do this in a motion in limine. You can do this in a motion to suppress. I had a motion to suppress recently. That was a four-part motion to suppress. I only won on the accident report privilege part, but based on that, I got a reckless offer. So we considered that a win. But if there is a crash in your case, you must always, always, always file the accident report privilege motion. All right. And so these are some of the big cases that we cite for accident report privilege. It, it has very specific requirements. So when there is a car crash, what is supposed to happen is that the officer who is investigating the crash is asking questions on the crash. Then another officer comes in and that officer has to say, hi, 
This crash investigation is now concluded. I am now conducting a criminal investigation for a DUI. And then they are supposed to read Miranda. All right now, these are the cases that are mostly cited to. Also, we cite to Vedner. Vedner summarizes this, and this is directly, this quote right here is directly from Vedner. Uh, I recommend you put this in your motion in limine or your motion to suppress. But again, in Vedner, they emphasize that Miranda has to be given. This is very important because there is actually there are actually quite a few Florida Law Weekly cases that say that Miranda is not required as long as you inform them that this is now a criminal investigation. I still argue Miranda is important. I still argue Miranda is a requirement, especially because you are going to learn in the depositions that most officers don't think Miranda is a requirement. You ask them when they're when they finish their crash investigation and they're now conducting a criminal investigation, you ask them, okay, at what point did you read Miranda? Oh, no, I didn't read Miranda because I wasn't asking them any incriminating questions. All right, well, number one, I wholly disagree that you are not asking incriminating questions because if you're asking someone, where did you come from tonight? How many drinks have you had? Those are all incriminating questions as far as a DUI goes. But what you're usually going to see is you are going to see that they say crash investigation is concluded criminal investigation has begun if it's the same officer it's called changing of the hats so it can be the same officer who's conducting the crash investigation and then doing the criminal investigation but they have to very clearly state to your client I was conducting the crash investigation, that investigation is concluded, and now this is a criminal DUI investigation, followed by Miranda, but again, be prepared for an argument on that. Now, in winning this, this is not a dispositive motion, that's why I said you can put this in a motion in limine if you don't have other motions to suppress, which again, you should, but it only mutes the audio, so just keep in mind that Accident report privilege doesn't mean that that entire portion of the video is redacted. All that's going to be redacted is the audio. And the officer can still testify that during this conversation, they can't say what the conversation was, but they can testify, yeah, during this conversation, they were slurring, they were swaying. The jury is still going to see if your client has to, you know, lean against the car for support or if your client has, um, is stumbling over they're not going to hear them but they're also going to hear it but they are going to hear the officer's observations about it and again i put in here keep in mind that you're going to probably have to fight the judge on whether miranda must be read but stand your ground okay now the next part is field sobriety exercises and emphasis on the exercises. They are not tests. There is a litany of case law that says you cannot call them a test because that has different implications. So, and I, and you know what, you'd be surprised. I still see that sometimes where they call them tests. Uh, so when that happens, you have to address that in a separate motion, but generally uh, for field sobriety exercises. State v. Amacrane. An officer may request a driver to participate in field sobriety exercises if they have reasonable suspicion that the driver is operating the vehicle under the influence. This detention cannot occur unless the officer has some objective manifestation that the driver is driving under the influence. And again, I say objective because, that would, one, that's the law, but objective versus subjective, right? You always have to keep that in mind because an objective manifestation is something like bloodshot eyes, slurring. It's something that I can see, that I can see it from the video, okay? And this is going to come, this is going to become very important when we talk about the Wiggins case. Uh, we're going to get to that. But nowadays, that video is so readily available you can actually rely on the video instead of the officer's testimony. Uh, but we're, we're going to get into that. One of the things that you have to remember with, flu, uh, with field sobriety exercises is that in order to request them, again, you have to have that objective manifestation. You have to have 
a list of factors of impairment. What factors of impairment did you observe that made you think this person was intoxicated? Because when they ask for field sobriety exercises, at that point, they're supposed to be asking this to dispel their suspicion that this person might be intoxicated, okay? They are not supposed to already think that that person or already have probable cause that that person is intoxicated. Um, so let's talk a little bit here about you can't argue command uh, requires probable cause. I threw that in because there is a recent case that came out. It's actually not even in Florida Law Weekly yet because it's still on a mandate. It was here from the 17th Circuit. Um, it's Marcellus. I can send you guys the mandate. But basically, there was uh, one of the things that we would put in DUI motions is if the officer is saying something like, I need you to do field sobriety exercises, then we argue, well, that is a command. You're not asking them if they want to perform voluntary exercises. You are commanding them to perform the exercises. And the difference is that to command someone to perform the exercises, we used to argue that required probable cause. A case came out recently, Marcellus, that uh, the judge agreed, the judge, the, the lower, the misdemeanor judge, the county court judge said, yes, this is gonna be suppressed because the officer commanded and they didn't have probable cause. And then when, when it went on appeal to the 17th circuit, they determined that commands don't require probable cause, that we've been misreading the case law and they, cite to this case, State v. Amacrane, that talks about testing field sobriety exercises, you have to have reasonable suspicion, not probable cause. So that really sucks because obviously probable cause is a much higher standard than reasonable suspicion. However, don't fret because I, we found a way around it and I actually argued that and it was successful. So we're going to get to what you can argue instead of this and also keep in mind again the law is ever changing even this right here about commands requiring probable cause and now it, you require reasonable suspicion that is my understanding is that is up on appeal because there was another circuit that disagreed so i guess they're going to let the district courts sort that out but remember you can still argue that okay so let's say the state says fine you know what, you can, they can command it. They had reasonable suspicion. So they could say, hey, I need you to do these exercises. You know what, it doesn't matter because the exercises are still voluntary, okay? And so sure, you may only need reasonable suspicion to command exercises, but it still has to be a voluntary consent. So you can still argue popple. You can still argue that this is acquiescing to authority, that they didn't actually voluntarily consent. This was an involuntary consent because they were acquiescing to authority. Uh, State v. Luim, that is an excellent case. That's one I was arguing recently as well. And that says that the officer did not have reasonable suspicion necessary to detain the defendant for the DUI investigation and requesting that he perform field sobriety exercises where the officer did not observe the indicia of impairment that is the prerequisite apart from an odor of alcohol. So then we go into Clip House, which is another very cited case that while the odor of alcohol is a factor that should be considered in determining reasonable suspicion, the mere odor of an alcoholic beverage is not inconsistent with the ability to operate a motor vehicle in compliance with the law. Again, remember, it's not drinking and driving. It's driving under the influence of alcohol to the extent that your normal faculties are impaired. So I could have a glass of wine and then still be fine to drive. I will have the odor of an alcoholic beverage, but that does not necessarily mean that I'm impaired and there has to be more. And just to go back to Luim, this is especially, uh, this is where I wanted to discuss a case. It's not on here because again, there's so many cases, but this is Wiggins v. 
Florida Department of Highway and Safety, which is a Florida Supreme Court case from 2017. It's 209 Southern 3rd, 1165. I can, if you guys want to contact me, I can send you guys the link for that. What that case states is that a court can reject an officer's testimony when it's contradicted or refuted by real time video evidence. Okay. So to give you a real life example of that, this is a motion to suppress that I just had last week where I was arguing that, you know, that it was an involuntary consent to the exercises. Okay. So in that case, I cited to Wiggins because we had video, we had the officer's dash, we had the officer's dash cam and the officer claimed lots of things amongst them was, um, that the person had bloodshot eyes, flushed face, odor of alcohol. And then we watched the video. And first we were contradicting the officer because the officer claimed lots of things about the driving pattern. It was a basic speeding case, but then the officer claimed, oh, well, he didn't pull over right away. And you know, there were other places he could have pulled over. And when he did, it wasn't actually into a parking lot. It was into this, in the swale and then he had a flushed face and you know he was he was swaying a bit but then we watched the video and literally the argument was judge what the officer said is simply not true okay we're looking at this video we don't see a flushed face we're looking at this video we don't see bloodshot eyes odor of alcohol okay it doesn't matter clip house says odor of alcohol by itself is not enough you know speeding is not a driving pattern that is indicative of a DUI. So in that case, the judge agreed and the judge granted my motion to suppress and specifically stated that the officer was contradicted by things in the video. Once you start contradicting an officer with anything in a video, all of a sudden their testimony becomes a lot less reliable and you can, you can knock out a lot of other things that that officer stated. All right. And in State v. Bertoni, this is an this is a, another great case where it talked about um, odor of alcohol, uh, red eyes, flush face and combative attitude. But there was no observation of any kind of driving pattern. So in that one, the motion to suppress was granted. Again, remember, it's a totality of the circumstances. So if the driving pattern is weaving failure to maintain a single lane, that in conjunction with a flushed face or slurring and odor of alcohol will probably be enough for reasonable suspicion unless you can attack that. All right, and um, this is voluntary versus involuntary consent. This is what we were discussing in order to get around this new law saying that an officer can command or demand someone perform field sobriety exercises without probable cause that they just need reasonable suspicion. So again, while that is being settled in the courts, because again, it's it's not quite settled yet, but again, I'll argue, argue that it's an involuntary consent. So Popple versus state obviously is a seminal case on that, but if you wanna get more specific in DUIs, the one that I argued was state v. Lynn, where the court held that the language used by the arresting officer in instructing a defendant to perform field sobriety exercises is consistent with finding that the defendant was acquiescing to a parent authority. And so then those were not voluntary. So in the, the motion to suppress that I just had, my client kept asking, well, why do I have to do this? Do I have to do this? Well, I don't really understand why I should do this. Okay, the judge in her ruling determined that clearly the person who was doing the field sobriety exercises, that this was not a voluntary consent because asking three times in a row, why am I doing this? Why do I have to do this? That's not a voluntary consent. Uh, the state's analogy in their argument was, well, judge, I can say, oh, I don't understand why I have to eat that soup. I don't understand why I have to eat it. It doesn't mean I won't eat it. So there you go. And I said, right, but if I'm going to eat the soup after all that, then I wouldn't say I'm voluntarily eating the soup. I would say I'm eating the soup because I'm acquiescing to mom's authority or what have you. So again, don't be discouraged that some of the law has changed because you can always argue voluntariness.
Okay. And then we have probable cause. So probable cause is something that you are always, always going to argue in your motion to suppress. And the reason is because a motion, you'd think that a motion to suppress where the judge agrees with you and also, and suppresses the exercises, you'd think that would be enough for them to null process the case. However, that's not actually true. Um, and there's a case here, it's not up here. It's uh, State v. Tuinen, T-U-I-N-E-N. It's 7 Florida Law Weekly Supplement 221A. It's a 17th Circuit case from 1999. Uh, and basically that case just says it was a refusal to do the exercises and uh, they were trying to su suppress the breath, saying that there was no probable cause to arrest them in order to get the breath because there were no exercises and it was odor of alcohol and just, you know, slurring the other signs of impairment. And the court said, no, there was probable cause for the DUI arrest. So the breath came in. So what I, what I recommend you do in your motion to suppress is you end it with a probable cause argument that is two-sided. One, say, oh, well, assuming arguendo judge that you agree with us that there was no reasonable suspicion to do the exercises or that they did not voluntarily consent to do the field sobriety exercises um, then judge we would argue there is no probable cause to arrest because without the exercises then these are the only signs of impairment uh, and that is not enough it's contradicted by the video etc and then go one step further and say and judge even if you do believe that the field sobriety exercises do come in, that there was reasonable suspicion to request the field sobriety exercises, there is still no probable cause because of A, B, and C. For example, uh, judge, you know, uh, there was no probable cause because they didn't do that badly on the exercises, or they had a, a hip replacement, and that's why they weren't able to do the exercises. You know, some of the factors that you might actually argue to a jury, you bring them in here. But again, you always want to argue the probable cause, even if it's not super strong, because you want to cover all your bases. So for example, with that last motion to suppress that I just had, the state didn't null pros right away. Uh, they still haven't null pros it. So the judge in her ruling made it very specific saying that, you know, even if the courts disagree with her on the reasonable suspicion that she does not believe that there was probable cause to arrest regardless. That way, boom, all the bases are covered. And even if the state uh, appeals one part of it, then hopefully it's just, it, it still gets null pros because again, without probable cause to arrest and they don't have anything. So we always want to include this probable cause argument, especially on a double refusal. In a double refusal, your argument is really gonna focus on this, on the probable cause, because you're arguing that there is no probable cause, there was no breath, there is no exercises. So when this officer is asking you to perform field sobriety exercises, that's supposed to be to dispel suspicion. Mere suspicion is not enough for probable cause. Okay. Now the tweening case that I was talking about before, that was a double, that was a single refusal, but the court was only considering that first portion of it. And they still did determine there was probable cause, but that's an older case. That's a 1999 case. And again, um, the state still likes to cite it, but just remember that, you know, probable cause argument, it, it's, it's, it's basically what you argue to the jury, but you're arguing it to the judge and you're arguing that uh, your client should not have been arrested. Okay. So this is where the slides end, but I did want to end it with something else which is that you do have to have a plea or trial meeting. What does that mean? That means that, and I, I like to do this before the motion to suppress gets argued. So your client really knows and has an expectation of what's going to be happening. But, you know, in the plea or trial meeting, the most important thing is that you want to have your notes from your initial client interview. You want to show them the video 
and you want to discuss, you know, at, at that point when you have your plea or trial meeting, you are going to have taken the depositions, you have the transcripts, you have all the videos, you filed your motion to suppress, and this is where you bring the client into your office. Uh, this is really important because you cannot have the first time a client sees a DUI video at the trial or at the motion to suppress. Ideally, they've seen that video before. And, you know, this is really important because the client knows what they look like. Uh, they're going to be the best person to tell you, oh, well, that's how I always talk. Or, you know what, actually, um, I had I had I had played soccer the day before and I was really cramped up. So my legs hurt. I didn't tell the officer that because it wasn't really an injury, but I, I was hurt. So and also on the on the opposite side, sometimes you think the client looks pretty good on video and they watch themselves and they get freaked out because they know what they look like and they say, wow, I I look hammered on this video. So this is something you want to address, because if they do feel that way, you can explain to them, look, I, I think you look fine. The jury is not going to hear you speak at trial, so they don't know what you sound like. And I don't think you're slurring. You might think you're slurring, but if they don't hear you talk and an objective person thinks you're not slurring, then we leave it at that. But you have to address all of this with your client. And the reason I say bring your initial client interview notes with you is because as Manny was saying earlier, um, you know, one of the things you want to address is your client's biggest fear. So some people will say, look, I can't lose my driver's license. Or some people say, I am terrified of going to jail. Uh, some people will say, you know what, I don't care. I want to fight this case. That may be the case in the beginning. And then you actually show them the videos. You go over everything. Most people change their minds. Um, that's when the client can make the truly informed decision of whether to go to trial. Because, you know, we tell clients we will happily go to trial with you, but we want to make sure that you understand all of the nuances, all of the possible repercussions. This is where you want to tell your client um, what you know about your judge. You know, there are some judges where we say, you know what, double refusal in front of this judge. Let's go to trial. You know, you're not going to go to jail. I mean, you can't guarantee it, obviously, but you know, you know, your judges. And then there are other judges where you look at it and say, yeah, you're probably going to get 10 days minimum if we lose, because that's how this judge is. And some clients are OK with that. Some people say, you know what, I'd rather I'd rather do it because I've, I think I've got a pretty good case and I cannot lose my driver's license. And even though we consider a reckless driving charge a win, the client might not because that usually means their license will be suspended. And um, although they can still get a hardship license for some clients, they cannot risk that suspension at all. And, you know, for other clients, they'll say, look, I will do a reckless driving because all I care about is my record and a reckless driving. You can have a withhold of adjudication, which means you can get that expunged versus a DUI is a mandatory adjudication. So there is no withhold on that. There is no expungement. There's no ceiling. The DUI is going to follow you forever. So for a lot of our clients, the reckless is the win because of the withhold. But again, you want to leave that up to the client. You know, as attorneys, we make a lot of decisions for clients, but whether or not to go to trial is up to them. We just advise them. So make sure you have a plea or trial meeting with a client. It's the easiest way to avoid any issues and any bar complaints. So with that being said, I think that's pretty much my time. Uh, I think we have a little bit of time for questions, if anybody has any. I don't see any questions. So here's my information. Uh, feel free to reach out to me um, by email or whatever if you have additional questions. I know this is a lot of information to take in. So, you know, let that simmer a little bit and uh, hopefully I'll hear from you guys.